So today I uh, specifically chose this topic because we've got a young sister, pretty that has been baptized, what, half an hour ago almost. She's 30 minutes young. She's still crying just out of the womb. Um, but why is this topic so important? I want to um, just mention to you all, you might not be aware of it or you might be, but there's a a movement that has um, crept into Christianity as just as by itself called progressive Christianity. And you can be sure it will make its way into our ecclesias too. And it's very really subtle. And we need to just remember what the Bible actually instructs us to do to, to be uh, not caught by this. So progressive, you know, is a word that uh, often is quoted by people and in terms of, you know, you mustn't go old and stale and you must grow. Now, those things are all true. We have to grow in the wisdom of God and grow as to, into mature people, as young people. But progressive often means, uh, in this case, it means Christianity has now, these people say it's progressed to something that includes and is kind of different than normal Christians believe. And it, and it, it really tries to... Um, you know, incorporate a lot of things that older conservative, conservative Christians um, thought the Bible taught and still apply. And then they say, no, uh, it's not actually so. And so a lot of more things can be allowed in the churches and so on. So you will come across this and you might go and research it. But, you know, um, this idea of keeping God's commandments, you'll see why it is not important. It's a theme I want you to notice this. It's a theme that runs through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So it's not like, okay, it was Old Testament, the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses and Israel. That was their time. But now we live since Jesus come. It's all love, love, love. That's kind of what people sometimes say. Um, just to give you an idea, from Genesis to Revelation, here you can see. The first time you read this idea of God's commandments, it's in Genesis 2.16. Yahweh God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So right in the beginning, when everything started, God gave a commandment. Now, I, I, I want you to be honest. When you think of this always in your mind, um, ten commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? Or thou shalt love the God. God, we have a problem there because the English in the old days is not kind of what we use. There's a difference when I say you will not do that, and if I say don't do that, can you can you hear? That? Don't do that means I would advise you. This is good advice. It's not a good idea to do it. And unfortunately, we read the Bible that when God gives a command, like an army commander, you know, stand on attention and you wait for the next commandment. No, it, it's not like that. We've got to change our thinking a bit. It's important. But look in Revelation. From Revelation 12 down to 22, you cannot debate this fact. The dragon was wroth with the women, went to make war with the remnant of a seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it tells us in the future, before Jesus comes, there's going to be a people... And the very fact why they're going to have all this opposition from the ungodly and whatever the dragon represents is because they keep God's commandments. They want to do what God has advised them to do. And other people will say, no, God didn't really mean that. You don't have to really get baptized as long as you just say, I believe in, and, and so on. And, uh, a lot of those things. Okay. Revelation 14, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. It's going to cost us a lot of patience to endure always having to struggle with other people who say, no, you don't have to do it, and whatever God has commanded.
uh, we seem to have lost Avante, uh, at least the sound from Lucas. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of seconds, see uh, maybe what's going on. So, so in the beginning, uh, where we first read of this word, God said, commanded the man saying of every tree you must eat, and then of the tree of good and evil you shall not eat. Here's a few things to notice. So again, we can't debate this. Adam was given a commandment. He failed to adhere to it. And then the result was the consequence that God spelled out clearly. So you can't want to come and say to God, well, I didn't know. God is in the rest of the Bible. We are told very clearly what's going to happen if we do not obey the commandments, right? And Adam and Eve became dying beings or creatures. Okay. I would like you to understand that the word command, though, has got nothing to do with like an order. The Hebrew is the word safar, and it's a primitive root meaning to constitute or to enjoy. Uh, enjoin to a point to put or set in order. Now, in other words, um, we have to get away from this idea that the commandments are like orders. It's God is, we have to understand God set up the world in a certain way. And they, uh, uh, the way nature is going to work. And then he created man and he had a plan. And now there's a garden and it's beautiful and God says to man, keep it. So God has set up this scenario, okay? For you and me, when we are born, we have no choice. We are born into a certain world and you can cry and complain and criticize till you blue in the face. Nothing's going to ever change the way what is presented to us. Uh, and it's not God's fault if there's difficulty in the world. Um, we have dealt with that. We can do it again another day. But... Um, it's really a case of God calling Adam and saying, yes, yes, the way I set things up, yes, all the trees. And then he says, that word thou shalt not in Hebrew, it's just the word no, it means don't, not, not to be, okay. So I really believe God did this. He, he, he didn't say to Adam, like in our English, like we understand, you will not eat of the tree. He said to Adam, look, everything's beautiful, just don't eat of that one tree. Please, you might even say, please, please don't eat of the tree because that then you will die. So it's good advice from God. Notice it, it's, uh, you know, a, a good way to understand this is if your parent, if a mother says to the child, please don't touch that plate on the stove, it's hot, you will get burned, you'll hurt. The child can't come and say, but I don't like the fact that there are plates in the kitchen, you know, I get burned. And if you later on, you'll understand my mom didn't do that to uh, make life difficult for me. It's, it's for my good. But the mom uh, would say it in a nice way. All right. So now, um, with that being said, um, notice what God says, uh, or the Bible tells us about Isaac in Genesis 26. Four. I will make you Isaac. You'll see to multiply and be like the stars in heaven and, and you, all nations will be blessed. It's the same promise God made to Abraham. But he made it to Isaac and said, I'm doing it to you because I'm going to be faithful to Abraham, your father. And why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Notice we just read in, in Revelation, uh, you have a right to eat of the tree because you obeyed and kept the commandments. It's exactly what Abraham did. Okay, so look at those words. What is it? To keep means to put a hedge around like a garden. So if God says, don't do this, and I suggest you don't do that, please live this way, not that way. It's for us to apply it, but we have to make sure we take those uh, guidelines and everything God gives us and treasure it like a precious garden and make sure other people don't come in and trample on it or put other weeds there. You have to, and that's what Adam had to do right in the beginning, keep that garden, guard it, right? 
So from, from now till Jesus comes, we are always going to have to keep our garden nice and be careful because other people with other ideas and that will come in and try and destroy it. Right. So, uh, and, and, and to, when you keep that garden, you are obeying God what he said. To obey God's voice is you listen to when God speaks and then you act on it in the way God wants it because that's the way he reveals his will to us. So obey in the Hebrew there means to listen with intelligence, not just to hear or to, you know, um, to listen because you hear someone say something. You, you take it in, you discern it, you think about it, and then you apply it and make it uh, um, change the way you're going to act. All right. So it's much more than just hearing something. It's thinking intelligently about what you hear. And if we ever want to sort of wonder what is it going to help us to be this way, to be so obsessed in a way to keep God's commandment, we should understand that what you do today will impact your next generation. And if you die a faithful man like Abraham, your family and your generation after, you're going to leave a legacy that nothing else can be a better legacy than what your actions for God will lead to in fellow uh, uh, subsequent generations in your family, people that follow that same route and also learn to be obedient. Right. So the charge there kept my charge. We, we, we think of charge as a cavalry of horses going or someone runs to you and charges you. But look at this. The word means to watch. It's the feminine of, uh, um, in Hebrew, the feminine of the masculine where a soldier stands on a watchtower and he watches around. So can you see, you should understand that you are in a garden, keeping it and you put a fence around and you're always watching because people are going to come and try and break down your fence. It applies to women, young girls dating. You're a garden, you put a hedge around it. No one's coming in there, right? Uh, only the people you want in there, right? Just in so many levels, okay? So to keep the charge is to hedge and watch so that other people don't come in and per like progressive Christianity come and water down our standards and our values. All right. And then again, the word commandments is enjoying the constitution of things. They're set up, right? Right. You've got to keep it. We, yes, one of the best ways for me to get to truth and understand when people go off the path is when they do not get back to Genesis chapter one, two, three, and get to how God set up things, how he created man and woman, what their roles were, what they were supposed to do, what his plan was for the rest of creation until Jesus comes and in the future. And once we move away from the, the way things were set up, designed, then we're going to get into big uh, trouble in uh, our worship, right? And then the word laws, we've discussed this in Psalm 119, so important. When you hear again that word laws, Torah, don't think of uh, the Ten Commandments. Think of God's guidelines and instruction manual, the path he's led out, it's straight where he wants us to go. The instructions, like a teacher, that's everything to do with that word laws, okay? Not, not just rules and regulations. All right. And to keep the laws of God really means you're going to walk on the way that he has set out. Straight road. You keep going on that straight road. And you keep on checking. Have I moved off that straight road? Uh, those two things are so interlinked, as you'll see in some other verses now. But really... And that's what it means. To keep the laws of God is to walk on that straight path he set before you. You've got to figure out what that path is. Genesis 18. Notice here. You always say, shall I hide from our Abraham that we thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great nation and the nations of the earth shall be blessed. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Isn't it interesting? When, when we become of that mindset to keep the commandments of God, 
we teach our children to do it and it goes from generation to generation okay so uh, and again keeping the commandments has strong links with looking what god uh, the way the laws the path he set before us and there we we keep uh, on uh, the commands by following god's path so abram now notice especially for pretty today and the other young baptized ladies it's so interesting. He went to a place he didn't know where it was. He didn't know what will happen along the way. And that's so lovely about your life in Christ now. You have no idea what it's going to be. Okay, but it's going to have these challenges of keeping your God. But here's the beauty of it. As long as you stay on that path... And you keep on obeying God, even seems, if it seems like it's against what other people and the mainstream or the peer group thinks or what they want to do, uh, or, and they think you're crazy or it's not the right thing or you're unloving, who knows what. The, the, the end result is going to be fascinating. You, you just know you'll get to some promised land that is, we know the kingdom, but even in your life now, it's going to be fascinating to see all the things God does for you in your life. So now I've, I want to show you an interesting thing that comes out of Deuteronomy about keeping the commandments. In Matthew 22, when they said, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? All right. Uh, so of your guidelines, God, of, of the instructions you are giving us, which of, the, of them, which is the greatest element of the way you set up things and the way you order things and the way you want things to be? Right? And notice it's not thou shalt not murder. Right? It's you shall love God your, with all your heart and your soul and your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto you, you shall love your neighbors yourself. You ask Jesus a question to trick him up like the Pharisees, he'll go on a spiritual level and it will just make you your mind bl blow up because. Uh, what's there are two commandments and they're all the great they're all e equally great and they first the most important command is love god and you know what if you love god it's like Martin luther once said just love god and then go do what you please because if you love god what will please you what god wants and you'll do what he wants isn't that fantastic so that's the whole idea. Okay. So in Deuteronomy, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy. So never underestimate that book. You will love God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind. And then, then in Leviticus, it's actually quoted that you will love them, your neighbors yourself. But in Deuteronomy, it's just repeated. Also, a lot of the laws, the guidelines is love your neighbor. If something is lost, take it back to him. God didn't say you will, if someone loses something and it lands up in your yard, you will go and take it there. No, he said, I suggest it will be a good thing. I'd like it if you take it back to him. Then we do what God does because we believe him, we love him, and the world is a beautiful place. Right? So the two greatest commandments are not you shall not. Here are the, uh, here are the greatest commandments. And it's quite interesting how God, Jesus does it. The greatest commandment uh, is love God and love your yourself and your neighbor. Notice, you love your neighbor as yourself. You first love God, then you love yourself. No man that loves himself hurts himself. Therefore, no man that loves himself is going to hurt his wife. Right? God says, I suggest you don't hurt your wife. Don't be nasty to your wife. Don't manhandle her and abuse your wife. Uh, and, and, and these two things are equal. You can't do one and love God lo uh, and, and not love your neighbor. Okay? Oh, I'm a good Christian because I love God, but I can't love my neighbor. You, are, you, you do all both together or it doesn't help. All right. And so we understand that we have to find out what it means to love God. And then we focus on that. Just put all our focus on loving God. Then the, all the other things will fall into place. Not so much of what I shouldn't do, what I shouldn't do, what I shouldn't do, but what I should do, then all those other shouldn't do is fall away. Notice from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, o Israel, your God is one God. Verse 6, these words which I command you, you shall be in your heart. Put them in your heart, in your thinking. 
Then you will teach them, you'll talk of them, you'll bind them for a sign, you will write them. These people were obsessed with keeping the commandments, but not in a legalistic way of, okay, if I do this and this and pick off one, two, three, four things, I'm a good Christian. No, it's when God says this, they meditated like David or they should have on the law and like Jesus who was 100% morally thoughtful of the law. Why did God say that? Why? What, what good is in it? Yes, I can see. So I'll, I'll do it. I'll just follow God, right? That's what we want to do with these commandments. Okay, we, we're carrying on. And here is where I started off why it's so important. Because you know what's going to happen? When you forget, when do you forget God, right? God said to Israel, you're going to go to the promised land. And when everything is nice and the life is good and so on, you're going to start forgetting about me. And then, then you're going to forget my commandments and you're going to go after these other gods, right? Verse 14, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are about you. We are always going to be in this position where people want to come water down the truth and we have to figure out what the truth is, what listen to God's voice, get it right, and then stay with that. Okay. Verse 17, you will diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testament statutes which he commanded you, and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of God, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which God swears unto your fathers. Same for us, okay? Blessed, it says in Revelation 22, 14, that do the commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life. What it counted for Israel in Deuteronomy, we are now in front waiting to go into the promised land is still the same for us. Okay. So now we just want to quickly address them. Love does not trump obedience. This is a kind of a thing you're going to hear from the progressive Christian movement and uh, a lot of people you know they would say god is more interested in your compassion and love that you show to sinners than them being obedient so you know people got gambling problems just love them allow them to come in and you know let them gamble even though they're addicted to it you know, it's nothing so much wrong it's much more important that we love them and they love us and so on you know loving is more important than being obedient that's a dangerous thought process that's coming into the church and we have to really understand why because love doesn't trump obedience love is being obedient notice notice here in 1 peter 1 verse 13 peter tells us gird up the loins of your mind so get your mind right you know uh, uh, to gird up your loins means to tighten up your belt and get ready for a fight or action or war or you know get your mind right be sober and hope to the end for the grace that will give you to when jesus comes as obedient children that's the way we're going to walk as obedient children, not facing yourself to the uh, according to the former lust but as god is holy so you must be holy in all manner of conversation means uh, behavior it's written, God said, I'm holy, meaning I'm separate and perfect and a mature being. You must also grow up to be mature in your thinking, not like children swayed by all kinds of new ideas. Yeah. Mature people understand what is right and they can reason and then make wise choices. So as long as we might understand that love is much more than a feeling, it's more a verb than a feeling. And that's the problem of the world. Ah, we should be lovey and dovey and feel good. And oh, I love my boyfriend and I'm in love. And those things aren't wrong. But in the Bible, love is much more of a, an action, a, cons a, a mindset, and that follows uh, action follows from that, right? So hope, uh, we know there's hope, faith, and love. Hope is waiting in expectation for something. So you must be patient. Faith. Uh, is when you so firmly believe in something that drives your actions so that faith without works is dead. So faith will do some works, you know, when they say it. But love, unfortunately, or we have to understand this, the Bible tells us that love leads to an action. You, by greater love has no man than this, then he will give up his life for his friends. 
love is when you sacrifice for someone else or sacrifice yourself for someone else, like parents will do for their children. Okay, so love is a serving thing, it's an action. I hope you can under, uh, like see like me why it is uh, so interesting in the Bible, why we keep the commandments. In 1 John 2, 2, 5, it says, hereby do we know God if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know God and keeps not his commandments is a lie and the truth is not in him, but whoso keeps the word in him, there is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we're in him. He that says, I, uh, he abides in God, ought himself also to walk as he walked. There's the tying up of this other idea. When you love God, you'll obey and you'll be on that path, the instructions, you're keeping the instructions, right? He says, the, he says something similar in 1 John 5, uh, who say, ever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone that loves him begets, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So that basically means you will love God and you will love Jesus who is the son of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. It's very clear from that we keep the commandments and our commandments are not grievous. So please remember that God does not give you these commandments to make your life misery or make you a prisoner or tie you down. In fact, it's not so difficult to apply these uh, uh, guidelines. You don't have to fly to the moon, okay? Uh, you don't have to be a supernatural superhero that can stop trains or something. You, uh, God just tells you, do this, do this. It's clearly laid out first. And it's rather to set us free than to make us unhappy and miserable. So what I'm trying to say before we end off with about three slides, love is proven by obedience. You want to really see if someone loves God, see how obedient they are. And to be obedient, you first have to hear, listen to, obey the voice of God, right? You first have to hear that voice of God. Then you have to learn what is he actually saying. Then you have to keep it. What's over it and, 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 and guard it because there's a, and then do God's commandments. To be obedient is to hear, learn, keep, and do. Hear, learn, keep, and do. Right. Look at the confirmation of this. 1 Kings 3 verse 3. Solomon showed his love for Yahweh by walking according to the statutes of his father David. Because David was obedient to God because he loved God. Uh, and we know, unfortunately, from, from the scriptures that Solomon, even though he did that, he still had some, some sins because he didn't get rid of one thing and it cost him dearly in the end. Okay. Notice here from Deuteronomy and 1 John, I'm not going to read this, but 1 John, if you put these things in tables like this, you'll see that again, the what John is talking about was spoken about in Deuteronomy. It's the same principle. You know, walk in God's ways, love him, and, and, and love is keeping the commandments. And it's not grievous, John says, meaning it's for your good. It shouldn't make you unhappy and grieve. It's not heavy. Okay. It's lovely when you do, we all know this, when you live according to God's ways, life is really a blessing. Okay. Now, have a look at this table quickly. What I want to show you, yeah, in Deuteronomy, the book uh, recaps on the history of Israel. Then there's exhortation in the book to be obedient. And then there's laws. Deuteronomy is not the second law. That name for the book is wrong. We'll talk about that again later. It, it, it doesn't mean, Deuteronomy doesn't mean the second law. The book in, in, in Hebrew, the book Deuteronomy his name is words because God just speaks, speaks to Moses and he says, please listen Israel, because then you'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. Okay. So, and we say, oh, it's just laws, laws, and we don't read the book. In, this is what the book does. It says, 
to recap is to remember. Moses says, remember, chapter one, to two, remember, and then please be obedient. Remember, there's a few laws. Please be obedient. Uh, be separate. Be obedient. Uh, uh, remember, isn't that what God did? Be obedient. Can you see the emphasis in this book is all about being obedient. Much more than there's laws. Okay? It's all about being obedient. And then look at Ecclesiastes 12 verse 3. After Solomon went through all the trouble to test everything in the world, bought houses and farms and had lots of wives. Thank goodness we don't have to do that. And he had everything he could enjoy. He said, this is all empty. It's smoke. It evaporates. It's useless. What is the final conclusion of what I found? Fear God and stick on the road. Just stick to the path. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Okay. Uh, I want to end up with this thing. A lot of people say life is not fair. Well, I, I would like to tell you that life is not unfair, not unfair either. Okay? Because we look at the world and it's in a mess and people are suffering, other people are not, and there's injustice. We, we know the cause of all these things and that God is allowing it. But life is not fair, neither is it unfair. It is set up by God. It's going, this was the way it's going to be. Since Adam sinned, there was going to be a troubled world so that we can learn we need a Savior and we have to go back to God and he will solve it. So if life is not fair or life is not unfair, what is life, young people? Especially for the young people. I wish someone told me this when I was young, but no one did. No one would because I only thought of it two weeks ago. <laughs> this is what life is. Pretty? especially for you now that you've been baptized. Life is limitless in future experiences. There is going to be so many choices coming your way in the future for me too tomorrow. So many things happening, so many people with so many different ideas, so many temptations, so many tests. And the question is, how are you going to respond to that? So whatever comes your way, you will go, you have to make a choice. And please remember that day by day, by the choice you make, if that choice gets you close to being on the straight path, then the next choice will be easier, happier, and keep you there. But the minute that choice takes you further away and further away from that path, you are further and further away from God, you're more in danger. So the whole point is just to carry on figuring out what the commandments are and keeping them. What choices are you going to make? And as a young person, that's why I'm so happy today. This young girl makes her choices from what God said. She said, you have to be baptized. So she figured out what that means and why did he say it and why is he correct? And the word of God was obeyed today. She made a fabulous, fabulous choice. Okay. With God in the equation. Because when you listen to God and you, you're really sincere and saying, what does the Bible really say? The word of God for us is in the Bible. It's not just a book. It's God speaking in written form. So if you follow this path, God is set out before you, pretty. You don't know what's uh, going to happen tomorrow, but because you keep on doing the right thing and, and, and in these lim limitless, you know, experiences, you're always um, letting God guide you, the end will be fascinating. I can't wait one day in the kingdom to see everybody and, and see the paths that God took them to get there. All right, so here we um, end of today then. We are going to remember this man called Jesus our savior, and, you know, um, he guarded the commandments of God, and the Pharisees were at him all the time. This is not what it says, and he would just say, haven't you not read? This is what's written. This is what God said. That's what it meant. It's never going to change, right? 
And that took him on this incredible journey that involves service and sacrifice and suffering that ended in life eternal. It cannot be different for anybody else. Amen.